but first I'm going to introduce my uh, the, the people who are who, who I'm going to have a dialogue with. Uh, first of all, I will start with myself for the one who don't know me. Uh, I'm Luca Romano from Italy. I manage a, a nuclear advocacy and education project with about 350,000 followers on social media. Uh, and uh, I'm, as a background, I am a physicist and I'm doing I have a PhD in industrial engineering. And uh, on my left, uh, I have uh, Mark Altes, uh, which is a nuclear engineer and is co founder of Eco Nuclearis, which is like the uh, Spain uh, eco modernist, I would say, uh, association. And then I have Andre Gonjalo Diaz Feliciano, I believe, I, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Um, which is a physical engineering student from Lisbona, Lisbon. And then I have uh, Rodrigo Leite Casimiro, which is also a physics engineering student. And uh, Guille Guillem Sanchez Ramirez, <laughs> which is a also a nuclear engineer and the co-founder of Eco Nucleares. Now, uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, they do right now have uh, quite clean energy grids with high penetration of renewables thanks to a a very, um, very interesting situation. They are the only countries in Europe that are have access to both solar and wind resources. Because Italy, for example, we have a lot of sun, but we don't get winds because the Alps, Alps blocks the current. While on the other hand, the Nordic countries, they have a lot of wind, but they don't, not very sunny, admittedly. Um, Spain and Portugal, they manage to get a lot of their energy from the sun and the wind. They also have some uh, mountains with, with, with rivers for hydro. So first of all, we are at the net zero nuclear booth, but do Spain and Portugal really need nuclear or can they get away without it? Uh, I, I have I'm the microphone. Sure. Uh, everyone hears me all right. So first of all, thanks for Thanks for coming, and of course, thanks for Nezio uh, Nuclear for inviting us. So yes, Spain, uh, as, as Luca pointed out, does have a reasonably clean grid. Uh, it's important not to lose track of that. And in part, it's uh, thanks to uh, the, our geography is uh, favorable in that way. We have a lot of sun in Spain. That's what people go to Spain for, right? And we have a decent amount of wind as well. But also, of course, thanks to our seven nuclear reactors. Uh, these seven reactors in five locations provide uh, co uh, consistently a fifth of our, of our grid. Now, could we run, uh, I'm sure we will get into the details, right? But could we run the grid without the nuclear? Why do we need it? Um, and just to start the conversation on that, well, we have done the experiment in other places. We've done it in Germany. Uh, we, uh, uh, we were about to do it in California completely. Uh, we luckily didn't get all the way there. But whatever the models say, uh, we have the evidence. If we close a nuclear plant, it gets replaced by uh, fossil fuels, coal, and mostly natural gas. And of course, that's because yeah, of the maybe, maybe yeah. the California is more interesting of a case study for you because Germany Certainly. is not sunny. Certainly, so yeah. So California is a climate that is more well similar said. to yours, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll just complement with one thing. That is, for us to keep a system where solar and wind is the main source of energy, we need some source of dispatchable energy. And nowadays what we have is gas, especially in Portugal, we don't have nuclear energy. And so our backup is gas. And we want to take that off and substitute it, substitute it with something that is carbon free, such as nuclear. That is one of our main purposes. And that's basically what we're doing here. I will ask, I will, uh, ask something like a more uncomfortable question. Right now, Spain and Portugal are the only two European countries that get access to very cheap natural gas because they get uh, they have privileged contracts with uh, North African countries like Algeria and Morocco, uh, and so they were not dependent on, on Russian gas, which means they were able to go through uh, through to 2022. Uh, without uh, big price increases that we experimented in other European countries such as Italy, Germany, uh, Eastern European countries and even France, Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, now, of course, in the long run we want to replace gas uh, eventually, but the, um, right now we know that it's also the cleaner of the dirty fossil fuels, like it's the cleanest of the three, right? And uh, can't Spain and Portugal 
uh, just keep gas on the grid a little longer until we manage to find a, an only renewable solution. Please keep in mind, I'm playing the devil's advocate here. I'm, I'm all in favor of nuclear. Everyone knows that. But I have to ask these questions. Um, sure. So te technically, yes. No? But uh, gas have uh, some problems. One of these is obviously the environmental uh, problem is a fossil fuel uh, produce CO2 hmm? and the nuclear, no. But uh, we have more reasons. Another uh, reason is uh, economical stability. Uh, gas is a resource that uh, have a very uh, unstable uh, market. Uh, a, a clear example of this was the, the past uh, gas crisis that we have uh, with the Ukraine war. And uh, in, the, in this time, uh, the, the prices of the, um, of the market uh, of the electricity in Spain increased uh, a lot. Hmm? Another problem is that uh, uh, gas is the uh, more expensive uh, uh, fossil fuel. And this uh, mark the, uh, uh, the price of all the market uh, because we have a mini uh, minimalist uh, system. Uh, <coughs> and, and exists a third reason. No? Uh, uh, Spain imports a lot of gas, and some of these gas are, uh, bio, uh, are um, we uh, sell? sell exactly Sorry. to another countries. If uh, all the gas that we uh, use not are selling, it's an economical reason, no? but uh, this is also true. Okay. Uh, in Portugal, we also depend a lot on African gas, like uh, like he said, uh, and it's cheap, but it it has it, it produces carbon. It's not a carbon-free source. We should maintain it until until we have another uh, source of energy, a baseload source of energy. But we should aim to reduce gas and to uh, substitute it for another for another source uh, as he said too it's very variable the prices we now import uh, with a great contract from Algeria mostly uh, but that may change and we can uh, experience the same fluctuations as Germany is experiencing Italy is experiencing so we should reduce our dependency on other countries and their prices thank you um, now, we are talking about Spain and Portugal, which are two different countries. We have different representatives. Uh, you speak different languages. You are, you are different nations, by all means. But can we really speak, say that you have two different electricity grids? One may argue you can't. Because um, Spain and Portugal trade a lot of electricity, um, and Portugal's uh, energy is uh, heavily a, a big part of Portugal's uh, demand of uh, electricity is actually imported from Spain uh, up to 30 percent depending on, on, on the year because of course there are years where you are when it's more windy or sunny and you get more electricity from renewables but when you don't you import from Spain now we already heard on this weekend um, that uh, Norway doesn't want to export electricity to Europe anymore. They don't want more uh, electric pipelines, and one can say why. I mean, you sell electricity, you make money out of it, it's convenient. Well, yes, it's convenient for the company who sells the electricity, but the higher demand, if you build more, more cables, the demand is higher, because more countries want your electricity, because Norway electricity is uh, clean and cheap. But Higher demand means higher price. So the price increases for all the Norwegian customers. And uh, Spain and Portugal are, fa are facing a very similar situation, Portugal in particular, because uh, they are importing a lot and Spain is exporting a lot. Now, does this put any constraints on the prices? Does the Portugal import increase prices in Spain? And does the fact that Portugal import a lot of electricity makes prices higher in Portugal as well? Uh, one thing we have is a lot of dependency from Spain and when we have wind in Portugal we have wind in Spain when we have s sun in Portugal we have sun in Spain so if we're so dependent th if the price increases in Spain it increases a lot in Portugal and 
the same goes around. We only uh, Portugal almost never exports to Spain because we have basically the same sources of energy. Spain has nuclear and m much g much more gas than us, so they can export to us. But the prices fluctuate the same. So, yeah, uh, it's a very interconnected grid from the supply to the consumption. Yeah, is, if I could add to that, so yeah, basically it it is a very fair point that one can look at both grids as one grid. Right, we're talking, uh, I think you mentioned the interconnection is the order of magnitude of half in terms of gigawatts of half or more of the Portuguese grid, right? And this does tie into the broader point, of course, uh, about uh, the second order effects of very large renewables deployments uh, on the grid. In this case, the two grids, which are basically one, right? Uh, because uh, to make a grid work on a high penetration re renewable, you do need a, 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 a much larger build out of of, of the grid and that is in, in uh, two countries in which we do not necessarily have that much uh, empty space so to speak uh, for that uh, in addition to of course all the all the costs um, that of the materials which is affecting all the fields all the fields right now thank you uh, and now let's get then to nuclear uh, Spain as you said has seven working nuclear reactors and uh, I also know that you have two more nuclear reactors that have been built but they are not working in, in the Basque countries, um, uh, Lemonis, I believe. Uh, Portugal has none. Uh, however, even the Spanish reactor, despite providing a solid fifth of your electricity consumption, are due to close in, in some years. And uh, the, current part, the current political coalition that is governing, uh, actually they won the elections recently, does not seem to be interested in keeping them open. Is there hope for Spanish nuclear uh, in the next decades? Uh, so, yes, indeed, uh, the current plan in Spain is to close our seven reactors within the next uh, 12, 12 years, uh, in line with the, the strategy of Germany, of course. Uh, basically, the two only countries to do that left. Uh, all of the other countries have abandoned the shutdown plans, and we hope that Spain will do the same. Um, and I forgot the question. Uh, if there is any hope... There you go, yeah, of course, of course. So, short answer, yes, uh, we do think uh, those seven reactors will not be shut down. And of course, uh, it's just a matter of physical reality. So it's a fifth of the grid, which you would have to re replace almost fully by, na by natural gas, as again, as we've seen in other places. Uh, base load, base load pa uh, power is replaced by base load power, and this fifth of the grid would have to be gas. We believe that um, it will just be physically impossible without getting blackouts to replace that much nuclear at that speed. Now the question is whether we do start shutting down reactors and get the blackouts before we change our mind or if we do the smart thing, which is not uh, shutting any down to begin with. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is if you shut down nuclear reactors and start getting blackout, turning that back online is not uh, really immediate, right? Of course, yeah. The <laughs> Even even if you shut you shut it down a year ago, and if you did not you know start dismantling or anything, it it's a long term it's a long term process it's a long turnaround, so we, that would expose the grid to to risk for several years even if it was just one or two uh, by 2027 and 2028 the 2028 the first ones uh, planned to be shut down. Uh, coming to Portugal, um, Portugal up until uh, a year ago was part of the anti-nuclear European front, in the sense that in the uh, European Commission and Parliament, there are two different uh, groups. One is heavily pushing in favor of nuclear on the European regulation level, like let's put nuclear in the taxonomy, let's put it in the net zero industry act, let's put in the hydrogen act, whatever. Uh, and it's, this grunt is of course led by France, and uh, there is also Finland, Sweden, uh, several Euro uh, Eastern European countries and more recently the Netherlands and Italy is an observer of course because we are at the point in history in which we are changing sides it happens uh, every time Germany is on a side we, we we choose Germany and then we switch to the other side we are in that moment right now um, so we are an observer uh, Spain and Portugal are not in the pro-nuclear group Portugal was in the anti-nuclear group up until a year ago and then they choose like basically a neutral stance. Is the public discourse changing, shifting in Portugal about nuclear energy? What we've been saying is that the nuclear, 
discourse, the nuclear discourse on Portugal is not in existence. Okay? The politicians don't talk about it, they avoid it at all costs. And even the parties, it's hard to find concrete data on their position of nuclear. What has been happening recently is that there was this net zero industry act in the European Parliament where the Portuguese deputies voted in favor of nuclear energy. And that did not make the news, the vote itself, but it opened the, the European funds for supporting new nuclear and the keeping nuclear active in the Europe. And Portugal has been helping in that. But we don't know the exact position of the politicians because they don't talk about it. It's basically a taboo. Okay, well, uh, how many reactors would Portugal need? Because uh, your, your energy consumption is not that high. I mean, there are small countries with still big energy consumption because maybe they have a lot of industries, but Portugal does not have a lot of heavy industries. Of course, are an industrialized country, but not like you don't make a lot of steel or stuff like that. So what's your, how many reactors would Portugal need? We believe there's space for up to three gigawatts of nuclear energy, replacing the gas we have because it will be a base load and we spend between five and seven G gigawatts of energy usually. That's the our consumption. So the three base loads from three gigawatts of base load from nuclear would fit in and will be possible. So in terms of reactors it will be either three one gigawatt reactors it will do or we could use some SMRs that may be more useful in industrial in growing up the industry in Portugal because that's also a possibility when you have an SMR you can take advantage of the eating processes also and you can take the industry to a higher level giving that thank you and uh, however as we said both Spain and Portugal increased the penetration of renewables in the electricity mix quite a lot. That means that there are several situations in which um, you get almost all your energy from renewables, then you have to turn the gas plants on when the sun goes down, for example, or the wind stops blowing. But that's not exactly the, perf the, the a good environment for nuclear power, because we know that nuclear power has a high capital cost, so when you modulate the reactor, which is something you totally can do, but it, you spread the capital cost on fewer kilowatt hours of electricity, hence the prices goes up. The electricity price goes up. So you can do it technically, but it's not extremely convenient. So does it make sense for Spain and Portugal to look at nuclear when you have so many renewables? I mean, it could make sense, but you would need less renewables then. You would you would need to like at some point stop installing renewables because if if when the wind is blowing you make 100 percent of your power uh you cannot turn nuclear up and on and off all the time right so again the question is does it make sense given the amount of renewables that you have to go for more nuclear the question is for both of you but especially for portugal because right now you have none and you are already overflowing the grid with renewables when you have power the first thing uh, that I <coughs> need to, to, to see is that um, <laughs> maybe this is a, a, a problem of the of re renewable energy, no? this very big instability. A, a, a good example of this is uh, the Filomena storm that we have in 2021 and uh, any solar panel or any uh, wind turbine uh, works uh, uh, mo more or less than a week or two or weeks. Um, okay, um, how we can uh, use nuclear power with this increase of uh, electricity from the renewable, renewable uh, sector? No? Uh, exist some alternatives. One is uh, to use this nuclear power to produce another things than electricity. For example, in hydrogen production. Um, Another option is to uh, build some uh, regular nuclear power plants 
and have a uh, some quantify that uh, can adapt to this change more like uh, SMR or uh, more like uh, the French uh, version of the pressurized uh, water reactor. Yeah, it's uh, I want the answer from Portuguese. Uh, yeah, uh, in Portugal. Sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> the question is, uh, well, I will rephrase the question specifically for Portugal. Okay. There is an ongoing claim by uh, people who push for 100% renewables that Portugal can get, is getting 100% renewable energy several moments in the year already. Like, there is an ongoing claim that in March 2023, for six straight days, Portugal uh, got all its energy from renewables and this is like being advertised a lot by anti-nuclear people now while it might not be entirely true it's still true that Portugal when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining gets more energy from renewable than they actually consume so in this environment a nuclear reactor would need to shut down to make room for renewables because they are cheaper so the, the nuclear power would get too expensive would be cut off the grid because cannot compete so does it make sense to install new renewables in Portugal uh, sorry nuclear in Portugal with this environment like with renewable pushing the prices so low yeah we had six days as you said uh, of only renewables or at least it we claim to have that um, but we also have a lot of hydro storage which helps to mitigate that intermittency um, and now we're pushing for 10 gigawatts, if I'm not mistaken, of offshore wind, which is a lot. And if we uh, get to uh, six days of the year uh, of renewable energy, imagine if we had 10 gigawatts of offshore wind. Uh, yeah, it might be a problem, a future problem, that we have too much electricity. Uh, but we should have the baseload. Uh, the main thing about the nuclear power is to substitute the gas. And that's our idea. It's not to add on the grid, add more gigawatts. It's mostly to substitute for a carbon-free uh, option. Yes, but uh, I'm sorry if I have, if I have to insist. Uh, the thing is, right now you're not using gas as baseload. You're using gas as a filler for when renewables... You're not yeah, using gas on a straight generation profile, like coal in Germany. You are using gas to fill in when renewables are, are, are not available, and then you turn it off when renewables are available. You can't do that with nuclear. I mean, you can, but it would push the electricity price very high, much higher than gas does. Uh, so again, I'm asking uncomfortable questions. I, I also some, sometimes know the answers to these questions. But I think it's important for the public to know the answer to this question. So I have to put you uh, under the fire. <laughs> I apologize about that. But, but it's important because people don't know that. And, and these are arguments. The, the arguments that I'm uh, making are arguments that you will have to face by the anti-nuclear people a lot. So first, I would, start, I would like to start with an analogy or a story. So we're in the middle of the summer and there's a night, a windless night. In Portugal, with the climate change, it's getting more and more drier. Okay, so let's imagine that hydro storage is down. We don't have dispatchable energy. It's in the night, so we don't have any solar. It's not possible. And it's not windy, so we have no source of energy. Even if we have more than 50% potential from wind and solar when they're not there we may not be able to turn on the switch at our houses that's energy security it's a thing that can affect us and we want to avoid it but now when it comes to we all have just signed during this COP the a connection to Morocco so we may try to export energy from if you have surplus to Morocco to try it we don't. We believe it's good to have more energy. It's better to have it more than in the West. Okay. And we can also f talk a bit about the world's following potential that 
friends as in their nuclear reactors that can turn it from 300 megawatts to 1200 megawatts in a matter of 30 minutes which is basically the same time it takes to turn up the gas reactor the gas power plant uh, one more thing uh, Portugal is also investing a lot in hydrogen uh, so that's a thing we can do with the surplus energy that we may have with a nuclear power plant and when the when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining okay I'm gonna uh, counter to that a little you can definitely do hydrogen hydrogen will be very important you can do it only when you have excess energy you need yes. a dedicated power source to produce hydrogen because hi electrolyzers are expensive to make up for that capital cost you need to have them work a certain number of hours per year which possibly should be possibly towards the 8000 hours per year you, you have you may have excess energy maybe 500 800 hours per year uh, if you buy the electrolyzers to have them work only 800 hours per year the capital cost is going to be spread on too little hydrogen produced and the cost will be way higher than, than can be considered competitive. So keep that in mind. Excess energy cannot be used to produce hydrogen. You need dedicated power plants to produce hydrogen, otherwise the capital cost of electrolyzer will just kill the competitiveness of the hydrogen you produce. You wanted to add something? Yeah, just <coughs> if I may expand a couple of points, right? Because uh, it's come up a couple of times, right? Uh, it, it happens sometimes in Spain, in, in Portugal, in, in Denmark, uh, happens fairly often, right? We see the headlines. You know, this country ran six days straight uh, uh, f with renewable energy, right? It was maybe windy, spring, so not much the, uh, demand, decent amount of solar. Uh, but uh, the grid is, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's critical infrastructure, right? It cannot work six days out of the year. It cannot work 365 days of the year. Uh, base load, as, as contrary as uh, it uh, sometimes appears, it is uh, a thing, right? And we know nuclear is um, is of course the ideal source for that. Uh, just you know, you mentioned before supply and demand, right? Uh, talking about the grid, if there is excess energy at points, well, that you know, supply and demand that's good for prices, right? In theory, it should uh, decrease the, the the consumer price uh, of electricity. Uh, and the other question you you posed, right? Is this is it possible that if we build nuclear, it would you know block the expansion of renewables, right? Because you don't need the power. Uh, well, I would ask, what is, what is the purpose? What is the priority? Right? Is the priority to expand renewables, or is it, is it to have clean power? Because if the purpose is to have clean power, then we should look at what are the sources that give it in the most quality kind of power, reliable, um, uh, inexpensive. If you know, building more renewables is often confused for the goal when it is the means, right, to to clean to clean power, I would, clean power, I would say. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with this answer. I was, I was hoping to get here. Uh, the thing is, it's a difficult conversation, conversation, right? Because it means that uh, we should stop investing like crazy in renewables and start making a plan of what's the optimal grid. Maybe Spain need only 20% of their power from nuclear. Maybe Portugal needs only three gigawatts of, of nuclear, give or take. Uh, the thing is, you don't need, may, maybe you can get, get away with 20%. Uh, Italy, 20% would not be enough because we are not a windy country. So, and um, uh, we have much larger electricity consumption than, than, than Portugal and also higher than Spain. So we would, wouldn't get away with 20% with, with, uh, nuclear. We would need probably 40% nuclear to be fine with it. Uh, but that's the thing, you need to plan how much nuclear nuclear you need, how much renewables you can afford and have the op optimized system that is fully low carbon. Now, speaking of which, what about uh, new nuclear builds in Spain? Because um, you have seven working nuclear reactors. You say that they are due to shut down, but we are in hope that the licensing license will be ex extended. Uh, and we know that nuclear reactors can work for 60, 80 years, no problem. Um, there are arguments being made that they could last even longer. But uh, electricity consumption is going to grow because we are electrifying industries, we are electrifying cars. 
and uh, we are electrifying the heating systems. Now, uh, Spain and Portugal do not need a lot of heating, but they need some still in winter, uh, which leads to increased demand. So, is there anyone proposing new nuclear bills in Spain? Oh, we are, but uh, <laughs> first things first, let's not... Uh, I mean, uh, right. I hope you count a lot in the future of your country, so but I meant something, someone like some political parties. Uh, no, not at the moment, right? Uh, the pro-nuclear stance right now is let's not shut down the one we have, which are all coming up to like 40 years uh, of life at the most. So they have at least as much ahead, right? They're not aged by any means. They're performing now better than, uh, than, than when they were new. Uh, of course, step one, not close them down. Step two, make a few more. We had in Spain plans for uh, quite a few more reactors, up to 12. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, uh, yes, we do have, um, uh, I would say, what, licensed locations, most of them next as expansion of the current plans. So we have the place for it. Uh, we will have the, dem we do, and we will have the demand for it, as you said. So yeah, of course, first, let's not close those ones, but next, uh, let's expand nuclear power. Let's be like France, let's be, you know, why not 50, 60, 70 percent nuclear? Oh, wow, well, that, that'd be great. Now, uh, <laughs> I, I've asked you about politicians. Uh, let's talk about the people. Uh, what's the, sen the public sentiment on nuclear? Are there polls? Do you have uh, any, any idea of what the public sentiment is on nuclear? And I'm asking this particularly for Spain, because when Spain gets anti-nuclear, they really get anti-nuclear, right? Because the Lemonis plant, was built and never turned turned on because I, there were terror attacks at the nuclear power plant. They killed, they, they placed bombs in the construction site and then they kidnapped and killed the director and they did it again with the following director. We are talking about, of course, the um, ETA, uh, the, the Basque terrorists that were not just anti-nuclear, they were like uh, uh, separatists. But the thing is, uh, things can get ugly uh, when it comes to nuclear. Uh, when people are against it. So what's the public perception of nuclear in Spain and in Portugal, of course? Um, the government stops not uh, two nuclear power plants, uh, like five, I think. That was the, uh, uh, the name was uh, Moratoria Nuclear. No? Um, and the public perception traditionally was anti-nuclear. Yeah. But uh, recently uh, it did change because we have a lot of problems with uh, energy. Uh, for example, the most important uh, thing that uh, was occurred was the uh, crisis with the gas. Mm? And the prices of electricity grows up very fast, but very, very fast. And this creates an uh, alarm in the society. And uh, a lot of people uh, start to uh, think that maybe not is a good idea to uh, sh uh, phase out the nuclear power plants and substitute with uh, with n more gas. Yeah, just so that's uh, it's getting better, right? And of course, the the thing with infrastructure like electricity is that people only notice it and think about it when it doesn't work. When the bridge you drive over works, you don't think oh, that's a nice bridge. I'm happy it worked. So it it's events like you know the, the peak of the gas prices that we had that really get people thinking about, uh, wait, wh where is this coming from? Why is it so expensive? Uh, uh, so I I in a way, if, if it gets bad enough, uh, it's, it will help that. Of course, our goal is for it not to get bad enough in the first place by creating this awareness. But um, uh, we have a similar thing with Portugal. That is, in reality, in reality uh, the, a lot of people don't have a strong uh, position. Have in not no, no know anything about nuclear and and we think that uh, these uh, people can be uh, uh, converted to pro nuclear if have uh, a lot uh, have the minimum information that uh, they uh, need yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna just add something on for the public uh spain is getting cheap gas but their electricity prices still increases and the reason is that the European electricity market works with a marginal price system in which the, the highest electricity source set the price for all the others. Now, Spain is getting cheap gas. Why is electricity still expensive? Because the, the most expensive electricity in Spain is not the gas, is the import from France. 
And France, during 2022, again, France gets very cheap energy from nuclear, but they still get the 5% electricity from gas. So the 5% electricity that France gets from gas was very, very highly priced because of the gas crisis. And it set the price for France, which set the price for the electricity that gets imported to Spain. And that price is the one that every electricity producer get, gets paid with. So while the gas stayed cheap in Spain, the electricity bills went up. And now on to the Portuguese people. How, is, how are people talking about nuclear in your country? You said politicians, they just don't talk about it. But the people? Uh, we don't have a poll since 2006. Okay. An, actual, <laughs> an actual poll that says uh, clearly if people are anti-nuclear, pro-nuclear or indifferent about it. Uh, and we don't hear about it, about it a lot in the streets nor everywhere. Uh, not a lot of people talk about it. It's a taboo for almost everyone. Sometimes I, ha I have dinners and people look at me when I say I'm pro-nuclear, look at me like, what, how? I mean, I mean, you explain to people that the N-word that you should not say is not nuclear. You can't say nuclear. <laughs> there is an N-word you shouldn't say. It's not that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when I talk to people, they just uh, think I'm crazy almost. <laughs> I don't know. It's a very rare, rare thing to talk about nuclear. And we sure... We'll be talking about it even more and everywhere. We will probably try to make a poll and get people talking about it. There was a recent Twitter poll that got like 70% in favor of nuclear energy. But it's just it was just from the energy industry, probably. So a lot of people got that. Yeah, the, the and the validity is very low. Yeah, social network polls uh, can give you an idea, but there are bubbles. So you, you eventually get a limited audience, which can be in favor, like totally in favor or totally against. If I make a poll on my page on nuclear, you get like 100% yes, but it's <laughs> it's not it's not really uh, reflective of the of the public sentiment a lot. I think we are uh, it's like 145, yeah, exactly. Which uh, and I we are scheduled to finish at 150, but we can take some extra minutes because Mark did. Uh, so I think we I will use these extra minutes for questions from the public. Hello, this is Juan Garcia. I'm from Spain. Um, well, I also have conversations with my friends about nuclear many times, and yeah, they look at me as you. But uh, one of the things we talk many times is the waste, nuclear waste. We never talk about the solar waste or the wind waste or CO2, but we, they, they, they only, when we talk about nuclear and energy, they always speak about what about the waste. So Spain is a country with 50 years of experience in nuclear, so we have uh, many experts working in many fields, and one of these uh, is, the, is the waste management, the radioactive waste management. I would like uh, the Spanish people to develop a little bit uh, about the model we are following and also for the Portuguese because we have a power plant very close to Portugal and I don't know if you, you can talk about uh, the perception of the people close to Almaraz plant what is the perception about having a nuclear power plant very close to your country okay <laughs> um, the first thing that is necessary to, to know about the, the, the nuclear waste problem is that not exist a problem the problem is solved uh, for example in in spain we have a um del cabril that is a storage for medium and uh, low level uh, radioactive waste and it works very well hmm? um from the spain uh, fuel uh, we have a, a similar uh, solution and now uh, spain uh, storage all uh, their uh, waste in the nuclear power plants, in a cask, no? and the, uh, in, in the future, the idea is to uh, put all this uh, spent uh, fuel in a, a geological, uh, in a deep geological repository, like, for example, the, they the, did in uh, in Finland. I think that the the sc uh, scurry that have uh, the population about nuclear waste is because they didn't know anything about uh, nuclear waste. 
For example, people <laughs> think that uh, spent fuel is like a, a green a phosphorescent liquid, like in The Simpsons, no? and don't know that it's a solid, can be managed, and, and, and it's easy. And, We and can it's, control it. And, hmm? and it's not green. <laughs> um, and, an and another problem that you uh, talk about is, yes, and, and the other um, waste, of, for example, of renewables, because they generate a, a waste and a lot of waste. Um, and another problem, hmm? radioactive waste with the time uh, are um, discomposed, they disappear. Hmm? But the other waste, like for example ar arsenium, exists uh, for uh, all, exists for the for the eternity. So we need also a, sol a definitely solution for this waste, and uh, it is necessary to. Uh, start to talk about this with the public well um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna add on to something the reason why people are not concerned about the solar and wind waste is because mostly we don't see it because sure the, the panels when they are out of, of order they must be dismantled and disposed of and same for the wind turbines but that's like 1% of the waste that you get from the solar and wind industry the most waste you generate during the production process um, which normally doesn't happen in Europe Like the, the the most of panels like are are manufactured in China. A certain step of the manufacturing production are 95% China controlled, uh, and that means that the waste associated to those production phases you will never just see is there in China, and so people don't worry about what they can can't see. And also, it's not easy to go to China and and docu document uh, about this waste stream because it's not easy to get permission to film a documentary in China. Like we, we do, we realized that we were dumping certain types of waste in Africa because someone went there and showed us. Uh, we should not be doing this, we are doing this, we are destroying those countries because we are deploying our waste in, in those countries. Uh, for example, waste in coming from the, the computer industry. There is a, like, they've been dumped in Africa for, for decades. Until we, we showed, hey, we are doing this. And people said, no, why we are doing this? And we stop. Well, stop. We are trying to stop. Um, but there is more transparency. The production of um, solar panels in particular and wind turbines to a lesser extent is not transparent because it's China controlled. And I'm sorry to say this at the COP where China representatives are present, but there is, I'm not, I don't want to say they are bad, but they're not transparent. Right. And if I may add just the reason, you know, to. The, uh, the example of the renewable energy waste, right? It's not specific to renewable, right? It, it's, it, it's a broader point, yeah, absolutely. which is mm, there's no perfect solutions. You know, there's compromises. Yeah. But and one thing that the nuclear industry does very well, it's manage its own waste. And because people are so worried about it, the process is super heavily supervised. Exactly. So there's no, it, it, it's a matter of, you know, it, it's a matter of uh, analyzing uh, with the data, right? The benefits and the costs, like everything else. And when it comes to nuclear waste, It is, it is, it has specific dangers, it has specific concerns, but big picture, it's easily managed, it's never caused a problem to people, and it's very little, right? Yeah, and, and there's basically none of it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted the, them to, uh, to answer the question of the, uh, of the gentleman here uh, about the, the perception of living uh, with a power plant next to the border. Then I will, I will head it to you, okay? What? Uh, was only a uh, short. Okay, sure. Okay, not that, uh, that they say uh, the quantify of radioactive waste that are uh, generated is, is very small. The people needs to understand that the quantify that uh, of spent nuclear fuel that they produce in uh, all their lives is only like a like a chicken egg, one kilogram of uh, nuclear fuel, only this. Yeah. Um, you're talking about Almaraz and the perception in Portugal about uh, the plant. It's about 100 kilometers from the border. I don't actually know anybody that lives close, uh, close to it, like in the Portuguese border. But I remember when I was younger, uh, being in the news, the well, Almaraz, and talking about Portugal having all the dangers of Almaraz. And I remember being afraid because the way they put it was like this is going to e to explode and uh, it's Spain's fault and we can't do anything about it. Uh, now I don't believe it, of course. I know 
the dangers, but I also know the benefits. I, I, yeah, I hope Portuguese people understand that it's clean energy and uh, even though there are some risks, there are risks everywhere. And yeah. I would like to add one thing that is a few days ago I was here talking to a person from Saudi Arabia, you're from the UAE, and they were like, do you know how is it living next to a gas power plant? Because like the air is heavy, you can feel it, you know? It's like when you live next to a nuclear power plant, you can get some fears, but there are things in the gas plant that can also scare, scare people and get them effectively sick. Uh, in the gas power plant, they can get sick from the pollution that goes through the air. Well, it depends from the type of plant. Gas, if burned correctly, does emit CO2, but not pollutants. B however, if you are next to a gas refinery, then there is a lot of pollution associ associated with, with, with uh, like uh, uh, refination of gas. And I will add, I will add uh, one more thing to you. Uh, nuclear plants can't blow up, can't explode. Uh, a gas plant can. And unfortunately, sometimes it happens, especially in developing countries where there is less like safety because they build, they need to be fast and cheap, and they don't care as much about like be them being super safe because they just need energy. And uh, every year, a number of these things happens: pipeline, gas pipelines, they blow up, uh, refinery fires that spread pollutants over in, in the air, and they are like extremely toxic. You sometimes even need to, to evacuate people from an area because there are too many pollutants. Um, chemila, chemical accident, um, uh, mining accident, especially in coal mines. Coal mines are, are extremely dangerous because there is gas that forms from coal that can blow up the entire mine, cause a collapse, trapping people. Every year, you, without, co without counting pollution, you have uh, hundreds to thousands of dead people from accidents in the oil and gas and coal industry. You just, they just don't make the headlines because they, are, they happen so commonly and so far from Europe that they, they just don't make headlines. And, uh, and this is the excellency paradox. The nuclear industry is so safe that whenever something small happens, something as small as a small, like, like this, uh, radioactive uh, capsule that gets lost in Australia, all the world is talking about it, even if it doesn't cause harm to a fly. And then you get like an oil refinery fire in, I don't know, Indonesia that kills 22 people, it happened last year, or a gas pipeline that blows up in Mexico and kill, uh, and kill like 100 people, it happened in 2017, and nobody's even talking about that. So this is called the excellency paradox you tend to notice events that are exceptional, so the events that happen to the safest industry, because you're not used to them. Is there any other question from the public? No, you want to do something? Uh, this remember me that uh, some uh, months ago, no, we have a very important accident in the uh, Petroquímica de Tarragona. Yeah, the I remember that, the fire, the, the refinery fire in Tarragona. Yeah, and explodes no, and kills some people. And, and, and it was in Tarragona and relative uh, close to the nuclear power plants. No, no, not, not have any relation. No? But if something like this or more smaller uh, occurs in a nuclear power plant in the next day or was close. Or. Yeah. And, and, and now, for example, people uh, don't remember this accident. Uh, we, we, we have a very uh, big problem of the public perception of the, yeah. of the risk. Which is why advocacy work and talking to the public is so important. And uh, also, we'll add a, a detail for you. Uh, three years ago, the French nuclear power plant of Gravelines, which is next to the border with Belgium uh, on, the, on the North Sea, uh, the, the North Sea, on the, on the Manche Channel, uh, was asked to improve their safety system because they could be damaged in the case of an explosion at the gas terminal, which is in Dunkirk, which is like 20 kilometers from it. Now, if the gas hub in Dunkirk, there is an explosion, there is no Dunkirk anymore, there's a crater, okay? <laughs> the, the amount of gas that is present there, if an explosion occurs, it would completely dwarf the explosion in Beirut uh, <laughs> that, that happened last year. Like, it, it literally, the amount of, of, of 
pressurized methane that you can that is dealt with in, in Dunkirk is massive and explosions there would wipe out the city. But the nuclear power plant needs to upgrade the safety system in case of an explosion to the gas terminal. Not the gas terminal have to improve their, their safety system to avoid such an explosion. That's just absolutely nonsense. Uh, okay, I think I'm gonna wrap it up uh, because I think we are out of time. Yeah, it's 13.59, so I've been extremely good at time management. I compliment myself. I want to thank you, our guests, for explaining us the energy situation in Spain and Portugal. And let's wish a nuclear future to both of these countries, particularly Spain, because they have a nuclear present to defend and a nuclear future to build. Thank you very much, everyone.